Chris, from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> Lovely. I see some of you have found the fans in back, and if any of you feel the need of a fan, please do grab one. Uh, I know it's warm today, and this will be appropriately short, I think. <laughs> oh. I'm just looking at you because you are a marvelous girl. <laughs> and and I can feel it. I really can. You guys are marvelous. When Reverend Tara asked me if I would like to offer a sermon this summer, I briefly wondered if it might not be too soon for me. Since my husband had only recently passed away, that thought did reasonably cross my mind. But when she told me that our theme this summer is on the road again, I realized that there were things about my recent journey that I could appropriately share with you. And I deeply appreciate the opportunity to reconnect with our congregation in this special way. This is not an age in which we can afford to withhold any good thing from we need to bring each other our best. It came to my attention in personal devotions shortly before my husband went into hospice that the difficulties we endure are not only useful to strengthen us, they also make us more useful to one another. So in a sense, I went into this dark time looking for the good I could bring back to you. And I think that actually helped make this journey better. When I think of journeys, I immediately think of journeys that are born out of a desire to experience something new, to spend time in beloved locales with treasured people. Something nudges us to want to go. It causes us to figure out how to make the journey happen. We save for it, and perhaps forgo other pleasures to make it happen. We delight in the planning as we select modes of transport, itineraries, and wardrobes. Our excitement gives us energy to make the trip happen, and the courage to deal with any potential obstacles. Then there are the journeys that are thrust upon us. The ones that no travel agent in their right mind would ever advertise. <laughs> the ones with destinations we are sure we would rather avoid. Our expectations of these journeys tend not to offer us any energy to assist us over the rough spots. We may feel assured that our faith and our faith community will assist us through these kinds of journeys or we may be forced to figure out anew what sustains us, but we are never without resources. If you called me an overly optimistic person, you would not be the first to do so. <laughs> and even I would not expect or advise any of us to look forward to this kind of journey with unmitigated joy. But what if when we find ourselves on this kind of a journey, what if we could explore it with a little less fear? When we dread what is in front of us, we usually have some pretty decent reasons for doing so. Previous experience, or common sense, often tell us when we are in difficult terrain and instills the caution that we need to pick our way carefully. And yet, there is a difference between exploring with caution and 
trying to deny where we are and what we are experiencing. One can close down emotionally and simply trudge through a problem. And I've tried that route myself. But I only found that the lessons to be learned were still waiting for me when I emerged on the other side. When I was growing up, we had three poodles, a mother and her two puppies. Andre was one of the brightest dogs I have ever experienced. He outsmarted the other dogs on a regular basis and understood situations with a depth that was remarkable. And then there was his sister, Sherry. Well, Sherry was one of the sweetest dogs I have ever known, but no one ever accused her of being bright. One day, there was a sprinkler out in the center of the lawn. Nothing fancy, no moving spray, just a stationary sprinkler attached to a garden hose. Sherry was standing on one side of the lawn, and you could just see that she was trying to figure out how to get to the other side of the lawn without getting wet. Walking around the lawn on the sidewalk would have done the trick very nicely. <laughs> but after considering the problem, my dear little dog chose the solution that made the most sense to her. She closed her eyes and proceeded to walk directly across the lawn. Now, Sherry, just like Sherry, there are times when I am tempted to just put my head down and plow through difficult situations. Sometimes it's simply the best that I can man manage. And just like Sherry, I know there will be someone on the other side of the sprinkler to towel me off and let me know that everything's going to be okay. We all need one another. No one is expendable. As much as we can all laugh at Sherry's sprinkler story, I said something about her in service of setting that story up that was simply untrue. There was someone who thought that Sherry was incredibly bright, at least in her own way, and that was me. When I started dating, it immediately came to my attention that in a way that mattered, Sherry was a better judge of character than I was. But I was astonished to see that even though the men I dated were all gentlemen, Carrie did not, uh, Sherry did not care at all for the first boy who ever took me out. She didn't growl or snap, but it was clear to me that she didn't like me. Over the years, she quickly made distinctions in character that I caught up to at a much slower rate. The dog was good. I learned to watch Sherry when my dates would come pick me up. <laughs> Watching all of the dogs, you know, uh, they, they all were instructive, but Sherry alone had the uncanny sense for who was deeply kind and who was just making a show of it. She never steered me wrong, and yes, the last guy she gave an enthusiastic pause up to was the man who became my husband. So when you are in the midst of any journey, don't be too surprised if your help comes from an unexpected source. We all know something, and we all need one another. Okay, so dating is likely not the most difficult journey you will ever encounter. What about the ones that are scarier? The first thing I can tell you is that you may not see the event that turns your life upside down coming, and it matters not. Just because you didn't see it coming doesn't mean that the universe doesn't have your back. 
If you believe in a loving God or in a loving universe, nothing about your not seeing an event coming diminishes the power that uplifts you. As fellow travelers, however, this does highlight the importance of our third principle, which is acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. If we are already engaged in acceptance in the pursuit of spiritual growth, then we are more likely to be ready to help each other when the unexpected occurs. The second thing I can report is that even when most of the things that I do to define myself were removed from me, I found that I did not cease to exist and that my life still had meaning. In most ways, it is not an experience I would recommend to anyone, but it did give me a priceless view of who I really am that I don't think I would have seen any other way. Even when you are in a difficult spot, don't be afraid to look at the view. You are likely to gain a perspective you can find nowhere else. Thirdly, try to practice simple acts of kindness. We human beings may not always succeed when we are under duress, and I know I didn't. But simply trying to find ways to deal kindly with those around me at difficult times has helped to ground me and remind me of who I want to be every day. And in difficult moments, I dare say that this helps me more than the people to whom I wish to show kindness. I want to show them kindness, but it does more for me. Fourth, actively choose where to spend your energy. In a difficult time, you cannot do all of what you usually do, let alone take on additional things. Pick your battles wisely. Fifth, make room for divine love and compassion. If you are intentional about developing your spiritual practice, and please notice that I did say perfect. We're, we're all on a journey, and it all takes time. You are creating space for that practice to express through you to others. I would wholeheartedly recommend spiritual practice simply for your own sake, but that is not the sole reason for having one. We you use covenant to do this for one another. Beyond that, there is an entire world out there that desperately needs us to be the best people that we possibly can. They need us. And they need us to be good. Lastly, we cannot let go of our joy, our love, and our hope. Happiness may come and go, but joy, love, and hope hold us together. Over the years, I have gotten much more intentional about not letting anyone rob me of my joy. It is simply too precious to let go of. If I surrender it to anyone, I find myself in a most precarious spot. I am suddenly susceptible to all sorts of wrong thinking, and that can be very painful. Yet it happens to us all now and then. You can absolutely recover from this. And yes, your community will have your back. But the falls you don't take, priceless. When we go into our more difficult journeys with a little less fear and a little more awareness of our resources, we can better feel the support that surrounds us. We feel more supported and less alone. We can focus better on what we are experiencing and perhaps even learn, learn more from it so that we can share it with one another. Soon, we will be singing the hymn, I Know I Can. There's a wonderful line in it. 
When sorrow heals my soul and burdens make me strong. Boy, that seems anti-intuitive. Yes, burdens do make us strong. But does sorrow heal our soul? I used to ponder that. But after my last journey, my latest journey, hopefully not my last, while I still find mystery and wonder in this line, it now makes sense to me in a way it did not before. And it is a promise that makes the tougher journeys more worthwhile than we let it, if we let it. So shall we stand now? Now join us for hymn number 1015 in your books.